with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah, ha, ha. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, April 16, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Executive Vice President at the Center for International Policy, Matt Duss, will be hand at handicapping World War III with us. Meanwhile, downtown Manhattan, Trump snoozes, but yet to loses. <laughs> well, it's really early on the trial. It's on his first day of the trial. They no, call me Sleepy Don. No, jur- no jury yet at his criminal trial. Meanwhile, Israel weighs escalation with Iran and an invasion of Rafah. Meanwhile, it kills five Palestinian internal refugees returning to the north. Protest shuts down the Israeli Biennale, Biennale exhibit in Venice and roadways throughout the U.S. Meanwhile, leaked New York Times memo exposes anti-Palestinian bias. Capitol Hill, Mike Johnson looking to split the aid package into four separate bills. And the House sends Mayorkas impeachment articles to the Senate. Donald Trump's $175 million bond in his fraud case is in doubt, and he has six days to show that it's real. Rand Paul to reintroduce the Biggs Amendment on FISA 702 authorization in the Senate. Department of Justice to file antitrust action against Live Nation and Ticketmaster. Supreme Court effectively abolishes the right to mass protest in three southern states and also allows Idaho to ban trans care for minors. There's a big special election in Michigan in the 13th and 25th state districts. If Democrats hold those seats, they will maintain or reestablish their governing trifecta in that state. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is... Nizzy Tizzy. Oh, I'm sorry. Newsday Tuesday. There's something in my throat. (laughs) Were you doing that on purpose? Honestly, I'm just like, uh, I, I, I was, I was, I'm just in a kind of a good mood today. Well, I ran, I I ran a few miles this morning. I'm trying to get into running, which is not something I'm, I'm that good at. Um, I'm, I'm kind of slow. I'm strong, but I'm slow. Um, and it's actually putting me in a good mood. So maybe I'll be a better employee with this. Well, that's what counts. Yeah, that's exactly (laughs) Exactly. Not my personal happiness or exactly. healthy habits or exactly. any of that. We will uh, we'll get the report on your increased productivity Fitter, and then we'll make the assessment productive. as to whether we want you to do uh, exercise in the morning. Uh, we're just going to go through the committee and we'll get that information. Uh, we're going to be talking about dust in a minute by phone on um, what's next and uh, what Iran was up to with that attack. Um, well, we know it was in re- what it was in response to, but there's some who are questioning the strategic value of Iran doing that, and that it may have made Israel more sympathetic. Uh, we shall see about uh, that and uh, and and what the implications are of Mike Johnson splitting the funding into four separate bills. Um, 
so that some people can vote against providing more aid to Israel and also uh, provide aid to Ukraine. And then I guess presumably uh, Taiwan if they want to. Um, but we will we will talk to Matt Duss about that. In the meantime, Donald Trump was in downtown Manhattan as a cr defendant in a criminal trial. He's got to be there every day. There is no uh, rules about whether he should be awake or not. But this is what he had to say. This is as he's uh, leaving the New York uh, City courtroom um, and found out, like, this isn't going to be fun for him. And, um, I mean, look, everybody wants fun. But they're going to have to find a jury, which presumably could take a couple weeks. Um, and certainly the Trump folks are going to want to slow walk that as much as possible. And then the case itself could take a month or two. But the the only clock they have on this is Donald Trump losing his patience. So that's going to be an interesting dynamic. If he at one point turns to his lawyers and go like, I, OK, just get a jury. Right. Um, we'll deal with this. We'll stall on appeal. Apparently they're asking them questions like, were you have you ever been a member of the Oath Keepers or of Antifa? Right. I mean, there's no Antifa membership, but they're trying to weed things out and trying to make it so that you have the most impartial jury possible. But Trump is still making the case that because everyone's from liberal New York, Manhattan, that they'll inherently be biased against him. And it's like, that's where you're from, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you should commit your crimes in a place that you think is going to be more symp sympathetic to you in that case. But here is Donald Trump as he departs uh, the first day of his... And, and let's be clear, it's hush money trial, but the, really the, the crime was falsifying business records to hide the expenditure of that money. So thank you very much. Uh, we had some amazing things happen today. As you know, my son has graduated from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. I'm very proud of the fact that he did so well. I was looking forward for years to have a graduation with his mother and father there. And it looks like the judges are going to allow me Pause to for one second. I, this is complete speculation on my part, but I would say 15% chance that he was ever going to go to uh, this graduation. Yeah, I think he's probably and, happy for the excuse. And I wonder... <laughs> nap, time, nap time, nap time. I mean, I went to Ivanka's, but... Am I going to go to Dum Dum 1 and 2 and then number 3? I don't think so. Tiffany, I didn't go to. Who's that? Exactly. Wait, what was the other kid I had? Tiffany, right. Okay. I mean, it's possible. Uh, it, it seems unlikely, but go ahead. With his mother and father there, it looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. If you read... All of the legal pundits, all of the legal Pause scholars. I'm going to say 15% chance that he would have gone at best. And I'm going to say, conversely, an 85% chance that Barron doesn't want him around anyways. <laughs> but go ahead. Now, one that I see that said this is a case that should be brought or tried. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. In addition, as you know, next Thursday, we're before the United States Supreme Court at a very big hearing on immunity. And this is something that we've been waiting for a long time. And the judge, of course, is not going to allow us. He's a very conflicted judge. And he's not going to allow us to go to that. He won't allow me to leave here for a half a day, go to D.C. and go before the United States Supreme Court because he thinks he's superior, I guess, to the Supreme Court. And we've got a real problem with this judge. We have a real problem with a lot of things having to do with this trial, including the D.A., because you go right outside and people are being muffed and killed all day long and he's sitting here all day with about 10 or 12 prosecutors over nothing, over nothing, over what, over what people say, over what people say shouldn't be a trial. So I just want to thank you very much, but uh, that I can't go to my son's graduation or that I can't go to the United States Supreme Court, that I'm not in Georgia or Florida or North Carolina campaigning like I should be, it's perfect. The radical left Democrats, that's exactly what they want. This is about election interference. That's all it's about. Thank you very much. 
Uh, aside from having to um, uh, put odds on whether he would go to the graduation or not, we should tell you that uh, I think New York, uh, the murder rate is down like somewhere like in the lowest it's been in 60, 70 years. One of the safest um, cities in the country. One too. of the safest uh, cities mm-hmm. in the country. Um, so, eh, maybe not so much. Uh, maybe maybe that's the problem. We don't have enough murders. And so now uh, the DA is just going around getting uh, uh, criminal fraud trials on uh, people who lie on their corporate forms. It just sounds complicated. There's this meme response to a huge block of text that might be like complicated and heavy where it says, I ain't reading all that. I'm happy for you, though, or sorry that happened. Yeah, right. And that's how I feel listening to Trump talk about, oh, I got to go to the Supreme Court and I got all these problems. And too like, long, don't, and TLDR, I can't, uh, don't it's read. Too, it's too much. I, I hope it works out for you. The reason, I mean, for people who may be getting a little confused with all the cases that he's involved in, the reason that this is interesting is because apparently this is the... Uh, or not apparently. This is the crime that is going to be alleged to have taken place before he was president, right? So that's what makes it distinct. The fact that it's also a criminal trial, right? Um, that also makes it uh, distinct here as well. From well, there some are of the also other civil uh, there are other criminal trials that he's True. facing in terms of the documents. But this it, is the first one, yep. right? That he's going to have to face as well. And then the other thing is that what he's going to probably try to argue is is that. He covered up the use of this money, this hush money that was paid to Stormy Daniels because he was trying to conceal it, this extramarital affair or whatever happened from his wife. That, I think, will probably be his argument. It might be his best defense. But the problem is going to be that uh, Michael Cohen will testify that it was made an expenditure. Um, And when you make it an expenditure, then it falls under campaign finance law. And that's what Alvin Bragg is going to argue. So, like... It sounds on its face as if it's maybe petty or you're going after a guy for having an affair. Like, is this it's Bill Clinton all over again? He would never use that. But it's actually not that because it's involved. It involves the money and the campaign finance laws surrounding that money and what it was used for. And And the the fraud, because they, they specifically concealed it. I mean, I suppose you could believe that Melania was checking Trump's books And then be like, hey, what's this? Why are you paying this money to the National Enquirer to sit on a thing? And uh, but that seems hard to believe. So, like, it's one thing to say we paid her so that my wife wouldn't find out. It's another to say that we lied in the books. Yes. To keep it from Melania. Now, maybe Melania is just like, sweetheart, I'm I'm bored. I'm going to go through the books again. (laughs) Yes. Just one more time. Let me let me use the the quick books, and I'm just going to log in. Yeah, I didn't um, really hear. Incidentally, I should also say, um, as agitated as he was uh, in the um, in that uh, video, um, this was reported uh, um, right here by uh, Maggie Haberman, um, which suggests that maybe he wasn't quite as agitated in the um, in the courtroom. Trump appears to be sleeping. His head keeps dropping down and his mouth goes <laughs> slack. Tell us about that. Well, Jake, he appeared to be asleep, and you know, typically his his head would would fall down. There have been other moments in other trials, like the uh, the E.G. Carroll trial, which was around the corner uh, in January, where he appeared very still and seemed as if he might be sleeping, but then he then he would move. This time, he didn't pay attention to a note that his lawyer Todd Blanche passed him. His jaw kept falling on his chest, and his mouth kept going slack. Now, uh, you know, sometimes people do fall asleep during court proceedings, but it, it's notable given the intensity of this morning and a lot of what was being argued. Trump appears. Hmm. Oh. 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 No. oh, oh. oh. Sorry. Sorry, folks. I actually that was a long clip. That was a very long clip. Uh, it was a little. Your jaw went not yep. just a little slack, really slack. Yep. Yeah. I guess. That's I mean, all right. That's the way I listen to things. It's a little easier maybe I to take to a nap when yep. you're not being criminally prosecuted. It just like, yeah. I love, I really, I desperately, he's too, he's too proud because I, d- I doubt he wants like any of the, any study of his brain or to, to have his head cut open to get his brain cut out when he dies. But I want his brain studied. I mean, he really has the ability to just plow through life and not a care a care in the world as he's on criminal trial right now (laughs) an old man it is true though that the courtrooms i was in jury duty this time last year and uh 
have especially to place jurors sleep. fall asleep and it, oh, sure. you're, it's wondering like oh gosh is this going to be a problem are we going to be delayed because that person is very obviously snoring <laughs> Uh, folks, uh, in a moment, we're going to be talking to Matt Duss, Executive Vice President, the Center for International Policy. Uh, but first, a couple of words from our sponsors. If uh, supporting foundational health was a sport, well, you would want Ritual on your team. They made Essential for Men, which is a multivitamin based solely on science and designed to help fill common nutrient gaps in the diet with 10 key ingredients. Um <clears throat> For me, the the thing that I've enjoyed about it, and I have to say, is that I've tried many times in the past to take multivitamins. Uh, this was on a subscription plan, and so when I ran out, I didn't forget to go get them again. And the other thing I like about this is I've gotten a lot more sensitive over the years as to where stuff I'm ingesting comes from, because it turns out that some places don't have any type of regulations on this stuff. Uh, and that is what the one of the the beautiful things about uh, Ritual is that uh, it, this stuff is um, rigorously tested and validated by third party for allergens, microbes, and heavy metals. Um, Ritual is a science-backed multivitamin for men 18 plus with high quality, and here's the, the key, traceable key ingredients. And make sure that it's in a clean and bioavailable form. In other words, they... Uh, have combinations that allow your body to take up these uh, vitamins um, in a way that's efficient. Has 10 key nutrients, two delayed release capsules per day that uh, dissolve later in the small intestine, which is also great because one of the other problems I've always had is, should I eat this now or do I need to wait for food to have food? Oh, and then I have food later and then I forgot to take my vitamins. So uh, it doesn't happen in that way. So it's gentle on an empty stomach, um, which makes me remember to take it. That's right. my biggest problem. Um, ritual multivitamins are vegan. They're non-GMO, project verified. They're gluten and major allergen-free, certified B Corp, and made traceable, like I said. Uh, ritual also has industry-leading sustainability standards. Ritual uses scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients and set ambitious climate goals uh, because it's a B Corp. It's also uh, female founded, meaning that they're holding themselves accountable to not just their company's financial health as a B Corp, but also to the health of people and our planet. Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash majority. Start Ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash majority, 25% off. And also, folks, it's April. You know what that means? It's sunsetlakesebede.com. They are having their annual 420 sale. And last year, thanks to Majority Report listeners and sunsetlakesebede.com, both uh, Sunset Lake and the Majority Report helped raise $22,000 to the Last Prisoner Project, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to cannabis criminal justice reform. And SunsetLakeSebaday.com is running it back. Starting to, uh, well, I guess it was last week. Everything on SunsetLakeSebaday.com is 30% off with coupon code 420. And if your order's over 100 bucks, they'll throw in a free 20-count jar of their Vibe gummies. That's with a little bit of TSA. <laughs> They've got two different types. Listen, they got multiple types of gummies, everything you can imagine. They have tinctures. They have smokables. They have pre-rolls. They have keef. They have fudge. They have coffee. They have um, uh, lotions. Now is the time to try this stuff out. I will tell you this. The Good Night Oil has Sebada. And Seba N. And I think it's the N thing. This I'm loving it. This is my now go to every night, the good night oil. The uh gummies with the melatonin, that's how am I able to get up and run before work? I have to go Put to you sleep in such early. A great mood. Truly, I need I, I I needed that to go to sleep. So thank you, Sunset Lake. Sunset Lake is gonna donate four point two zero percent. See what they did there of the proceeds from the sale to the last prisoner project, 
and we at the Majority Report will match that donation. By the way, we should probably be saying Sebe um, or something like that. I did, didn't I? Maybe change up a little bit more. Sunset Lakes Sebe. 420 oh. sale ends April 22nd. Head over to sunsetlakesebede.com right now to take advantage of this deal and help raise money for cannabis criminal justice reform. See their website for sale terms and restrictions. Okay, uh, quick break. When we come back, Matt, uh, Matt Duss will be here on the phone. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Joining us now, Matt Duss. He's the Executive Vice President at the Center for International Policy. Uh, Matt, welcome back to the program. Thanks very much. Um, give me, give us your assessment. I mean, obviously, um, th- there has been a leading up to the Iranian um, uh, retaliatory strike. I don't know how else really to to reference it. Uh, on Israel, um, there seemed to be a growing push in the Senate, maybe even in the House as well, to conditioning aid to Israel. Um, characterize first, like the Iranian response to Israel hitting its consulate in Syria, and then what what, what supposedly has happened in terms of like the. Uh, uh, the the growing skepticism about uh, funding Israel. Right. So, yeah, as you mentioned, on April 1st, uh, Israel struck an Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, killing a number of senior Iranian uh, military officials. Um, Iran waited, you know, several weeks before responding, but made clear that they would respond in the way they did, um, was to launch a series of drones and missiles, uh, into Israel. Now, it did not kill anyone. It injured um, a young uh, Arab Bedouin girl who was apparently in very serious condition. Um, but that was in part, I think, intentional, but also on, uh, on Iran's part, but also because there was a very well-coordinated response by the United States, Israel, other allies, including Arab allies in the region to share intelligence to knock down a lot of those uh, drones and missiles as they were on their way. Uh, but I, I do think it's worth noting that there were communications between Iran and the United States making clear that Iran would be ready to de-escalate after it kind of did what it had to do. That's certainly not to defend uh, its striking in Israel. Uh, we should you know, absolutely not accept that. Um, but I do think there was an interest, as we've seen all along, that Iran does not want to get drawn into a wider open escalatory conflict, and neither does the United States. Unfortunately, it's unclear whether Israel shares that right now. Well, I mean, it seems clear that they were trying to provoke. I mean, you don't need to speculate on it, but it it seems clear that they're trying to provoke some sort of response to galvanize Western support. But my assessment, Matt, is that Iran, uh, that Iran didn't apparently use their best missiles in this area. They they telegraphed it for around two weeks. I mean, what's your view of how in- intimately the United States was involved in getting them to kind of do this for show to a degree versus retaliate in the way that would have been more deadly? Right. I, again, I think it's been clear to the U.S. Um, that Iran does not want to escalate past a certain point, but because of the seriousness and again, the unprecedented, na- unprecedented nature in its own right of the Israeli strike on the consulate on this diplomatic facility in Damascus, it, it, it felt that it needed to respond. Um, but it made clear that it understood it did not want to respond beyond a certain level that would, that would you know, create a, a, a worse uncontrollable escalation. Now, I think the idea that one can control violent military escalations is itself a kind of dangerous illusion. But there was at least messages sent between the U.S. and Iran that made clear that Iran needed to do something, but they would be ready to step back after this was done. And as you said, the Israeli government, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu knows that his political career depends on sustaining, prolonging, and possibly expanding this war beyond just Gaza. They've clearly, you know, reaped a benefit in kind of international opinion now that they have been attacked on their territory by Iran, and so attention is off Gaza uh, for the time being. I don't expect that to last very long, given that the catastrophe 
continues in Gaza, is continuing to get worse. Famine is, is, is continuing. But for the time being, Iran has kind of got, or I'm sorry, Israel has kind of gotten a win out of this. Um, I want to go on to, to just like, you know, um, uh, how strategic what Iran did um, uh, was. But what, how, how, uh, how far from the from the realm of possibility is it that Iran not just communicated, um, we have no interest in escalating after this, but also, incidentally, here are the coordinates from where we intend to more or less to, to, to I mean, is that, is that yeah. an absurd uh, concept or is it uh, very possible? Because there is a real quality to this that felt like Iran felt that they need to do it. We can talk about maybe wh- why they felt they needed to do that, but um, wh- how uh, out of uh, realm of possibility is that they coordinated where it was, they were going to attack? It's not clear to me. I've seen no evidence or heard anything that indicates it was that specific. Um, I, I, I do think it's clear that there was some communication, as, as I said, that we need to respond, but we, we will be ready to de-escalate after. But I think that one of the reasons I'm skeptical of that, you know, the, the, the information shared was that specific is because just as, you know, the United States and Israel and others gained some intelligence and information about the nature of Iran's response and their capabilities, although even as, as Emma said, I don't think they showed their full capabilities here. Iran also gained intelligence and information regarding the response by Israel and the United States, its allies, Jordan and others, how that intelligence would be shared. Um, and, you know, how so they, they are also taking that into account for a potential future engagement. All right. Interesting. Uh, and that they would not have been able to gather that information had they shared much more specific coordinates the way you suggested. What, is, what was the um, w- were there pressures on Iran to respond? I mean, for instance, um, you know, I read this interview with uh, Richard Haas, uh, where he said his perspective was that Iran made a strategic mistake because it made Israel a little bit more sympathetic at a time where Israel was becoming increasingly isolated and, uh, and, and, and more and more of a pariah. But putting aside the question as to whether there has really been a narrative turn and if it's uh, durable, um, what what is your uh, perspective on 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 that and why would iran uh i understand why they you know that it was retaliatory but do they have domestic pressures that they're dealing with or is it uh this is a freebie where they can basically make an assessment of what the defense mechanisms are no i would tend to agree with Haas there i do think overall uh, this, you know, this was a bad decision by Iran. It does, you know, it, it's, it's seen as a win for Israel. So from Iran's perspective, um, this, was, this was an overstep. But again, as we know very well here, you know, internal politics can often make you do stupid things in foreign policy. Uh, that's true. And it's certainly true for the United States as it is uh, for other countries. And I think this was an example of that. But, but why was it stupid, though, Matt? I mean, I, I, I'm, I feel like we're asking, on, uh, we're asking Iran to act in a way that we would not ask any other country to react. I mean, they have now shown restraint in two separate instances with assassinations of their generals. Uh, when it came to Soleimani, they clearly coordinated that response with the United States. And now uh, in, in this uh, strike on their consulate in Damascus, they had to respond to Israel here to establish some sort of deterrence. It just seems like a rational way for an actor to behave in this way. All right. I, I, I tend to agree in terms of we can imagine a, a much more vigorous and aggressive response. So I totally agree that there was a level of restraint that existed here. But I'm just saying, like, even if I acknowledge Iran's need to respond for a whole set of reasons, I can I can agree with the analysis that they came out of this, you know, in, in a bit worse of a position than, than they were the day before. Gotcha. Um, wh- do you have a sense of where we are now? It was announced today that Mike Johnson intends to uh, introduce four different aid bills, um, I guess, presumably because there are people in his caucus and he knows there are people in the Democratic caucus who might want to vote for Ukraine funding, but not for Israel funding. Uh, whereas uh, I suspect there's a decent amount of Republicans who want to vote for uh, Israel funding and not Ukraine funding. 
What is your sense of a um, what that bill looks like if it makes it to the Senate, and b what's happening in the Senate? <laughs> you know, I, I wish I had a smart answer here, but I feel like we're just playing Calvin Ball at this point, right? In in the House, you know, I'm hearing this morning that you know Massey was telling Johnson that he's going to be kicked out soon. Um, so who knows which of these bills will actually make it to the floor? What the votes will be? What will what kind of what you know vehicle will be sent over to the Senate? Um, you know, I, I I tend to agree with the idea that it was a mistake to combine all of these spending bills, Ukraine, Israel, you know, in the first place. I think we should have up or down votes on these things. Um, so if that happens, I, I think that could potentially be good. But again, I, I I know better than to predict what's going to happen in in the Republican led House at this point. Um, since we're talking about Iran, I, I don't know if we ever had a conversation about the Iran deal. I think we did, uh, maybe, uh, but that was some time mm-hmm. ago. Uh, have you revisited? I mean, and 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 certainly, I'm. I, I suspect that uh, that you shared a certain amount of either mystification or sense of like missed opportunity by the Biden administration to get back into that nuke deal that Trump had basically sunk uh, that was was drawn up by Obama. In retrospect, based upon Biden's reaction to Israel's actions over the past five, six, I guess, six, seven months, and the intensity in which he has been unwavering in supporting uh, this uh, slaughter in Gaza, do you d- does it change your assessment of why Biden didn't get back into the uh, the Iranian nuke deal quicker or at all for that I mean, matter. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really change my assessment because my assessment was and is that it was a huge blunder. It was a huge mistake for Biden to kind of slow walk reentry into the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, this is something that he had committed to pretty unequivocally. Um, to do as president. And yet once he took office, they kind of took their time. They were trying to see if there's any way to make it stronger. They were dealing with, the, you know, they were dealing with a, 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 a Bob Menendez led um, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. They wanted to make sure he got their nominations through. We all know how that went. Um, but yeah, it, I, I said at the time, as did many of us who were supportive of the deal and, and continue to say now that that was an enormous lost opportunity, not just for dealing with the Iranian nuclear program, putting a cap on its nuclear program, but the ability to kind of have established some measure of communication and even trust um, with the Iranian government that would be extremely useful in times like this. That well, would I guess be extremely useful. I guess what Go I'm ahead. asking is, uh, I mean, um, is was that a blunder from their perspective? Because, I mean, uh, you know, going forward with the uh, Abram Accords and um, and this level of support from Israel, it makes me wonder if um, it was either it was incompetence or it was ideological, the, um, ideological yeah. or whatever, transactional or whatever, that there are other reasons why they didn't get into that deal other than just being slow. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I do think. Clearly, there was an element of ideology here. Clearly, Biden's support for Israel is deeply ideological, but it's ideological of an earlier era. I mean, Biden, I think, is, you know, he's very representative of Cold War and immediately post-Cold War democratic foreign policy thinking. Um, And, you know, he has, as we know, you know, a kind of deep and perhaps inexplicable and unjustifiable, unjustifiable confidence in his own foreign policy judgment. Um, his decision not to jo- rejoin the nuclear deal, or at least to slow walk it in the kind of fantasy that he could get a better, stronger deal when he ultimately lost it. Um, I think that is, you know, that is a product of that kind of thinking. We just need to show strength and then we'll get our adversaries to do what we want. I mean, I think the decision not to re-engage in the kind of opening to Cuba, again, another huge uh, president, a win by President Obama. Um, but because his thinking is from an earlier era, Biden did not recognize the importance of that and did not choose to invest in it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think you can explain it uh, partially, at least in that way. Um, I guess, lastly, because I know you got to jump in a minute. Um, is there a, 
the the thing about donald trump was there was always this question of like um are, are we going to recover in terms of foreign policy like you know if i was uh from a um if i was a foreign leader uh, I would be a little bit nervous, uh, regardless of whether Trump was there or not, because I'd be like, this seems like an unstable country that could go from Obama to Trump uh, to Biden. But now it also seems like a Biden has like, wh how do you even pretend that there are some type of rules based uh, international order that we're operating under, as opposed to just sort of whatever we wake up that day and decides in our best interest. I mean, it, 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 it feels like this is going to have lasting impact on our ability to, I don't know, even exert soft power. Right. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and I wrote a piece for the new Republic in December, you know, and we spoke shortly after I returned from Ukraine, I wrote this piece about, you know, the U S Ukraine policy versus its Gaza policy and how, these two policies basically show the vast contradiction um, in our, you know, our support for the so-called rules-based order in one case and the cover we're giving uh, to an ally that is absolutely violating every, violating every tenet of that so-called rules-based order uh, in another case. And it is doing enormous damage to our ability to create a more secure and, and just world. And I think future, future administrations are going to have to contend with that. But again, I think it, it, it does show, and you know, I, re, I kind of quote the old, there's a saying by the Peruvian dictator Benavides that says, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. Um, and I think that is unfortunately what the Biden administration has shown about the rules-based order, for my friends, everything, and for my enemies, the international criminal court. And when we are trying to make appeals to the non-aligned world, the developing world, the global South, whatever term one wants to use, this is going to be enormously harmful um, when we try to get them on board to, to address shared challenges, whether it's Ukraine or other things, on the basis of an appeal to international rules and international law. They will always have this. They have a whole list of, of hypocrisies they can point to, but this one is so absolutely glaring, it's going to be very hard to surmount. Um, and lastly from me here, Matt, uh, does... Washington have a sense of the true death to Gaza death totals. We haven't had an update on that 32, 33,000 uh, figure in about two months at this point, if not more. Yeah, I mean, I think it is certainly around that, probably more. We, we have no idea how many are still buried under the rubble. It may, may be that many underneath the rubble. Um, it is just an ongoing catastrophe. I mean, I, I, I lack other words for it, um, but it is... You know, I, I couldn't have imagined a few months ago that we would still be seeing this, you know, now in April, over six months after this. And we all have the question, what's it going to take for President Biden to, to change policy? And it, it, apparently it's nothing. He's apparently just decided that we are going to support Israel to do what, whatever it wants to do and occasionally leak about how disappointed and angry he is with Netanyahu. But the policy will not change. Um, and when do we, do you, uh, how close, I mean, w w if you had to guess as to what the number of, uh, of Democratic senators at this point are, um, are on the sort of like, uh, condition aid, um, uh, caucus, if you will, I don't think certainly they haven't all been yeah. public about it, but how many would you say yeah. at this point? I would say you've got about probably about 12 to 15, maybe a few more. I think, again, the Iran strike has kind of um, put a little chill on that. But, I mean, this this war is going to continue in Gaza. Um, so, I, so I would expect attention will turn back to that. But, again, I think what's so strange about this conditioning aid debate is that it is not, you know, some kind of new invention. It is the law. Um, it's just a law that we have not applied consistently. Um, and I think that's all that those of us who have been pushing this debate are asking for. Matt Duss, um, uh, yeah. Executive Vice President at the Center for International Policy. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Glad to. Great to be on again. Thanks. All right. Uh, well, let's just roll right into uh, some other news. Uh, uh, oh, we should say, oh, there we go. Uh, we didn't have Matt for too long there. 
Um, I know. I know. I could have asked him a million I know things. we could have uh, spent another uh, half an hour on that. I want to know if anyone's talking about sanctioning Israel. That's what I want to well, know. Well, my question is, you know, the we talk about the narrative change. Like, I haven't seen any any shift to more um, being more sympathetic to Israel, but I'm not in D.C. So I wonder where the narrative is shifting. Right. And that's horrifying to me if people in D.C. are being like, okay, we're back on the status quo now. We're back on Team Israel. Because I think it's pretty obvious that Iran's reaction was at um, military targets and that sort of thing. And that sort of contrast should be drawn at any opportunity discussing this. I yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I, I'm not surprised, though, that it didn't uh, create more uh, sympathy. I mean, the you know, you, regardless, the uh, military targets, it was all intercepted. There's, the, you know, two or three hundred uh, missiles and drones, whatever, over the skies. Again, it was a retaliatory strike. It, it, what Israel did was shockingly unprecedented um, in terms of striking a consulate. And this was the first time that Iran had done um, essentially a homeland to homeland attack on Israel. You know, Haas in that interview had said, Iran has other mechanisms in which to, uh, you know, retaliate. They could use third parties, essentially, and uh, make it clear that it was Iran. That's not a hard thing to do. They certainly had the ability to do that. Um, but I, I, I'm not surprised that it didn't take the wind out of some uh, people's sails on some level. But uh, I don't think it's going to be too long before um, we're back to where we were a week ago uh, on this, but rough is still certainly know. becomes a, yes, certainly becomes just a way for the, you know, United States and certainly, you know, it's not like there's a lot of hostility towards Iran and the U S government. The idea that they're, you know, uh, sending missiles outside of their country anywhere um, in many respects is would be enough at least to get a reaction for in the in the short term so um we'll see uh central asian managed democracy tired of the ww3 hyperbole will any country besides yemen support iran militarily if war breaks out might be wrong but it seems like it would just be another regional war not uh, near the scale of a world war we're being cheeky about that, but Iran is a vast country with mountainous regions that, like, if we thought Afghanistan was a boondoggle, the idea that in conflict with Iran wouldn't be one of the most catastrophic things that this nation could engage in, even if we're doing so tacitly in support of Israel. I mean, Israel wouldn't, like, it. it, it is, I... I World War Three is is hyperbolic and maybe a little cheeky, but it would be catastrophic. Well, and I think also the idea that um, there wouldn't this would not provide an opportunity for um, you know uh, Russia say I don't know what they would do necessarily, but it, there would be a lot of opportunity to escalate uh, beyond if you had a full on war between Iran and Israel. Uh, there's a lot of different ways in which stuff gets escalated there, right? I mean, you, you got shipping lanes that would be I I implicated. Uh, I'm, it, it, it can't I, be. I, I think it's. I think it's easy to dismiss it as like, well, this would just be a regional war. Iran's a pretty big powerhouse, and you're talking about a very volatile region where there's a lot of international interests and money. Um, that is uh, implicated when you start talking about shipping lanes, you start talking about oil and fuel. Um, I mean, you look at just, you know, like the knock on impacts of, of Ukrainian uh, wheat not being able to get out for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. What happens when uh, oil is not getting to China? Yeah. What happens? I mean, there's a lot of different implications there that I think that that. We can't really understand. Um, and what over what principle? I mean, that we would get involved in supporting Israel in this kind of context. Like, it needs to be de-escalated at just extreme costs. Like, we right. need some leadership from America here.
Dave from uh, Missouri, I think you should have someone on from outside Western media. The attack on Israel was a success as far as proving they could strike. If you telegraph your attack for weeks and give warning to everyone in the area and missiles still get through in the most contested airspace in the world, in a restrained attack, it's not a good look. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think you're missing the, the point. What we're talking about is um, uh, U.S. foreign policy. And um, I don't think all the missiles were, obviously uh, not all of them were intercepted. Um, the, there was a child hurt in a, uh, an attack in a um, f- relatively remote part of Israel where uh, the Druze are. I think there were definitely some um, missiles and uh, drone strikes that got through, but they were all geared towards being sort of like not at the uh, at the population centers. I, I am quite sure that Iran established their um, capacity, you know, but that's not, the interview was about, just to be clear, uh, U.S. foreign policy and what the implications are going to be. That's why we talked to, to, to Matt Doss. At, at the end of the day, I'm not as... Um, I mean, terribly, Ilhan, Ilhan uh, Omar is coming out and saying, I condemn the attack on Israel from Iran, right? Like there's going to be, you know, we we can provide that commentary around what Matt is saying. But what's valuable for for Matt it, it, to have Matt Duss on is just like he's a progressive voice in the in in uh, the foreign policy world who the is blob. has the ear of the kind of people who can make a difference. Right. So. All right. And those well, people are psychos. <laughs> Yeah, and outside of Matt, like outside of these very few people, like, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, there's very few, like even some that, like, I mean, not as good as Matt on these issues, but people I thought that were fairly good and liberal uh, on these issues, I saw like two years ago being like, why do people have such a problem with Elliot Abrams? Uh, To be clear, Dust is not one of those types, but that's like the sort of milieu we're swimming in here. Um, Let's go to, uh, let's talk about what's happening with the 702. Uh, because there's uh, some work for you to do here. Um, we mentioned this uh, yesterday briefly, didn't have too much time to go into it. Um, in the wake of 9 11, um, the uh, U.S. national security state was granted a lot more powers. And um, I think it really based since. Um, I think it was since the Church Commission, we had this FISA court, which is the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance um, Act, and it created a specifically a FISA court. And this FISA Act um, allows the NSA and uh, God knows what other agencies to uh, tap the phone lines of calls that are going to uh, foreign individuals in foreign countries. But if the calls are initiated in the U.S., they are obviously also scooping up U.S. individuals' information. And um, there's two different issues here in terms of this reauthorization. One is there was a, uh, a Biggs Amendment, which would have basically said that that information, so I call Pierre in, I don't know, Algiers, and it turns out Pierre is uh, somehow loosely maybe went to a meeting one time or donated money to a charity, who knows? But they have uh, now recorded my call with Pierre, and they have the ability to sort of like, you know, I'm on there now. And they also have the ability, I think, to get some uh, other records for me. The NSA has access to that. But also, once that information is collected, U.S. intelligence and national security, and I think even the FBI, has the ability to just go in and dip into that in the same way that, like, maybe we would go and check out the archives on our... Uh, on our Amazon server. And the Biggs Amendment would require a court-ordered warrant if you're going to go and check out uh, the U.S. individuals 
in that database. Um, that's one issue that failed. 12, 12, uh, 212 to 212. And I think it would have failed by, by one or two more, but uh, somebody switched votes just to uh, make sure that they had the ability to, to, to maybe, bring it back up. maybe bring it back up or to, or to, to stop it. I'm not 100% sure how that worked. but It was brought by uh, Andy Biggs and Pramila Jayapal as well, but Biden administra the Biden administration is uh, f you know, against that amendment and fully in favor of, of this reauthorization. But uh, on top of that, uh, Elizabeth uh, Goyton, the uh, senior director at the Brennan Center for Justice, um, said that there is a new uh, phrase, essentially, that was uh, buried into the Section 702 of the reauthorization uh, bill. And um, Senator Ron Wyden has called this power terrifying. Uh, she has described this as the biggest expansion of domestic surveillance since the Patriot Act. Under current law, she writes, the government can compel electronic communications service providers that have direct ac access to communications to assist the NSA in conducting Section 702 surveillance. So what that means is like you know, Verizon or a Google have to turn over the communications of targets of uh, Section 702 uh, surveillance. These targets have to be foreigners. They have to be overseas. Um, but if, again, I call Pierre or Pierre calls me, they have me as well. Um, they change the definition of, quote, electronic communication surveillance provider. And um, what it is effectively doing is it means that any company or individual that provides any service whatsoever um, may be forced to assist in NSA surveillance if that service has access to equipment on which communications are transmitted or stored. So that means like servers, mm -hmm. routers, cell towers. And you think about this, like communications... There's no business that doesn't have right. communications or anything. What about public Wi-Fi or, 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 I mean, places that have U.S. Like businesses that provide Wi-Fi yep. to their customers and therefore have access to equipment on which communications transit. Mm -hmm. Barbershops, laundromats, fitness centers, hardware stores, dentist offices, she writes. The list goes on and on. Commercial landlords that rent out office space. Like, I don't know, like WeWork or whatever it is. Um, that includes, you know, Journalists' office, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, there was pushback on this. And so on Friday, there was exemptions for hotels, libraries, uh, shops, and coffee shops, and a, pl a, other, a handful of other establishments. But um, the majority of U.S. businesses remain fair game. The amendment even extends to service providers who come into our homes, she writes. House cleaners. Plumbers, people performing repairs and IT service providers have access to laptops and routers inside our homes and could be forced to serve as surrogate spies. And on top of this, and this is reminiscent of like when the FBI was going under the Patriot Act to libraries and getting information as to like what you took out, the librarians couldn't tell anybody about it. None of these people or businesses would be allowed to tell anyone about the assistance. They were compelled to to provide and um she writes unlike google or verizon which have the ability to target or to to turn over just the target um targets uh, communications right so mine and pierre's right these other businesses don't have that level of sophistication in what they're doing and so they would just basically hand over the equipment um, and you know, once it's in the NSA hands, it's supposedly up to them, uh, on the honor system, not to, uh, get too much. Uh, supposedly this was done because there is one specific technology that, uh, the administration and the national security state wants access to, but they don't want to tell anybody what that technology is. So they made it really broad. 
as a way of, of getting, uh, getting that in a single type of service provider. Um, but they didn't want to know anyone to know what that service provider was. Um, bottom line is there, uh, may be an opportunity. In other words, there may be amendments in the Senate. Certainly, uh, Rand Paul has said that he's going to do that. And then Wyden is talking mm -hmm. about it too. Um, and if there's not an opportunity to, for amendments, the senators should vote against the bill. So we have a, a link uh, to this page on demand progress. Um, you can dial this phone number, 202-899-8938, and they'll connect you to your senator's offices. Uh, there's two senators that you have in your state. And um, you want to block the everyone is a spy provision in the FISA surveillance bill that just passed the house. Um, you can use those words. I think that's what they want. And so uh, we have a link to that, but again, the number is 202-899-8938. And uh, you can call um, to limit the expansion of class of businesses required to assist in the FISA 702 surveillance program. Um, yeah. Apparently the last count, this was from Reuters in 2023, showed that in their database of foreign intelligence, the FBI, quote, improperly got information from uh, Americans 278,000 times. And that was under the pre-existing 702. And that's what basically Reuters is reporting that we know of, right? So this would be an expansion of uh, multiple times over. It's incredible that after the Snowden revelations, we're back to double dip and then get more greedy about the NSA. 278,000 yep. times. Yeah. Divide that by the U.S. population. Like, this is a vast, like, ugh, man, that's crazy. Yeah. Whoopsie. <laughs> we'll try to do better. Whoopsie, we'll do. We'll try and do better Trust. by doing it exactly. more. It comes exactly. down to like 140,000 by next quarter. Whoopsie. Um, so uh, call on your um, uh, your senators, and uh, hopefully we can um, uh, slow that roll. Uh, we're going to take a, a break and head into the fun half of the program. What an efficient first hour! Yeah, we just nailed it. Twelve fifty nine. Bingo. Um. <laughs> Folks, you can support this program by becoming a sustaining member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only help the show survive and thrive, but you also get the free show free of commercials. You get the fun half. You can I am the show uh, in the fun half. All you got to do is download the app, majority app. It works for everybody. Uh, but if you log in as a member, you get some extra features all for free. Um, but, of course, your membership... Um, uh, is hugely important to us, and um, we appreciate uh, your supporting us if you can do it. You listen to the show one or two times a week, three times a week, four times a week. Uh, sign up to become a member. Join the majority report.com. Also, Cedar Seeds, 42% off with the coupon code APRIL. Grow some plants, ladies and gentlemen. Super easy, super easy to do, surprisingly easy. Buy six of them, put them in the little uh, planters on your windowsill, and then all of a sudden, look what happens. It's actually pretty fun. Uh, cedarseeds.com, cedarseeds.com, 42% off with the coupon code APRIL. Also, don't forget the Just Coffee, fair trade coffee and hot chocolate, all fair trade, co-op owned, uh, use the coupon code majority, get 10% off Emma ESVN. Oh, and, uh, merch. Yeah. We got all our, uh, 20th uh, anniversary merch. We'll plug that all year though. We got that. I mean, though, that, that black shirt is really nice. I got to say. I like say. the gray myself, but yeah, the black is guy. pretty sweet. All right. Well, um, oh, you're wrong. but the mug Democracy. is great. <laughs> <laughs> who likes it? Who likes gray better? You? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jesus. Bradley, will you break the tie? Gray shirts are just awesome. Black. Boom. All I'm right. I'm wearing a gray shirt today, actually. Huh. Okay. I am too, actually. 
I'm mm. wearing blue because the, the, right. the Rangers uh, locked up the uh, President's Trophy last night. A little bit of a celebratory. I like how, how you can't use the w, uh, they can't use, she can't use the W word. I Just won't. say locked up. Well, they did. They Because, well, they... They locked up the present, meaning they have a home ice advantage for the rest of the playoffs. Well, um, do you think that's going to enhance their chance of what? Of um, advancing past this round to the next round, hopefully. Um, but I won't go any further in discussing such a thing. But we did talk more about the NHL playoff race on ESVN yesterday. We talked about the play-in and the, who we think is going to advance there. The Arizona Coyotes moving to Salt Lake City, some more billionaire malfeasance there, basically gutting that franchise for parts and then sending it to an owner for a billion dollars and then aaron Rodgers has some more conspiracy theories we had a great time laughing about it yesterday it was very tim pool-esque but so so fun that i honestly put it on our sound sheet today and we may get to it into the fun in the fun half uh, youtube.com slash espn show matt uh, yeah, tonight I saw Rod talking about Iran. Uh, left reckoning. Excited to talk about that. Um, to probably talk about the Spellman or the Spellman Professor too, which we're going to play in the fun half and uh, the USC stuff. Uh, Patreon.com says left reckoning. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're at thirty-three thousand subscribers, so a third of the way to the hundred k. Uh, so uh, go subscribe, folks. All right. See you in the fun half. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. We'll take some phone calls. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight? Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm gonna go start off. Who libertarians? They're so stupid though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 one half. 38 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. 543 trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. <laughs> On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt.